Okay, yeah, hey, Dr. Russell, would you like to give us a brief introduction? Yeah, my name is Monty Russell. I'm the president of Dinner College, Keanu Nishle, Monty, Clan of Scotland, Bushes Jane, Machine, Shinche, Ado, German, Shinola, and good morning to you, Stephanie. Yes, good morning. And the reason why we have you here today to give us an interview is because there's something inside your statement about the strategic design and plan that really caught my attention. And that statement was, we need to think boldly. Now, can you go ahead and tell me what you meant by that? What I meant by that primarily is to say, if we're going to look at the next 50 years, we need to not think about tomorrow. We need to think about 10 years from now, 20 years from now. What is the economy going to be at that time? When the college started 54 years ago, we had a coal economy transferring from a livestock economy. Now it's changed. So what is it going to turn into in order to be able to meet the future, in order to be able to meet, you know, the, the, the aspirations of the Navajo Nation? We need to think boldly. We need to think about what is out there, what is possible, what can we do? We know the Navajo Nation, the Navajo people, they put their mind to it and they put their hard work into it. Anything is possible. And that's what we want to do here at the Net College is try to create those possibilities. All right. And then you also had mentioned redundancy when mentioning the themes. Do you see an improvement in the themes this year from the previous years? Yeah, I think one of the things, of course, what we're doing right now is we're creating a strategic design process. In the, pl in the past, we call this a strategic planning. And when you plan something, you need to know all the variables. And yet, what we learned from the pandemic in this period of time is that we don't know all the variables. We have to be able to design something and be agile to be able to try something new. This didn't work. Let's do this. Let's do that. That type of thinking is very different from a real specific plan. If this happens, then we do this. And if this happens, then we do that. And we lay these steps out. But we all know that's not really what we like to do in life. Life happens, things change. We have to be able to meet those changes. So through this design process, this strategic design process, what we're trying to do is to say, what do we need to do to be bold, You know, to use the word earlier? What do we need to do to try to meet that new future? And the old ideas got us to where we are. They're not bad, they're good ideas. Our previous um, you know, founders, they created the foundation. Well, now it's our time to build the walls higher. It's our time to actually be able to build something better and bigger. And so I think that's what we're looking at. So these new themes are different because they're making us stretch our imagination. They're making us stretch our goals. They're making us try something new. They're making us be creative. And I think that's something that the Navajo people are known for is the creativity within either artistic or also in finding new solutions to old problems. And you said another statement you had made was the process is more important, perhaps more than the completion of this strategic design process. Yeah, I think one of the things that a lot of times, you know, you've heard the heard the 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 cliche, the uh, it's not the destination, it's the journey that counts. In many ways, that's what we're talking about here. It's not about where we end up in terms of this college, but who we bring along in that process. So the process is important in terms of hearing from all of our stakeholders, all of the people that care about the college, you know, whether they're students, whether they're parents, whether they're business owners, whether they're politicians, whether they're neighbors, whatever that case is, hearing from them, what do they think in the future? What do they think is going to happen? How can we try to work together? That's what I mean by that process is more important. We're going to come up with answers no matter what. And as we've seen in the past, these type of answers and solutions change over time. But if you get more voices into a conversation, if you get more points of view into a conversation, you're then expanding the perspectives. And that's what we really want to do with the college right now. We want to expand our perspectives. We want to look at things in a new way. You know, if you put a bottle in the middle of a room and everybody is looking at it from a different perspective, they're all seeing something different, but it's still that same bottle. That's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to say we're looking at the college, but we're all seeing it from a different perspective. How do we try to move forward, create the college we want, 
part of those strategic themes allow us to do that. You know, one of them being academic growth and quality. So it's not just about building, you know, new programs. It's about building quality programs. It's not, it's not just about increasing our enrollment. It's being strategic in that enrollment. Where do we see this happening? So these themes that we've identified now allow us to do that. Accessibility. Everybody in the country is talking about college accessibility right now. We view it from a different perspective. What that means for Navajo is very different from what that means for students in Phoenix. But we need to be able to look at this. The other thing that that also looks at is half of our Navajo Nation lives on the reservation, but that means also half of them live off the reservation. And if we are Danette College, are we just a college for the reservation? Or are we really truly a Danette College? And that means if somebody is living in Washington, D.C. or Seattle, Washington or Minneapolis, that they too have just as much right to earn an education at the nation's college. I'm so glad you said that. You led right into the theme that I was going to bring up and you pretty much answered my question that I was going to hear. And I mean, ask you, you know, definitely there are a lot of students out there that live off the reservation. You know, my child, for instance, you know, just graduated high school and she chose to move off the reservation. You know, but I told her that, you know, although you're over there, Dinette College is still an option for you because it's now an online program. You know, it's an online institution now, you know, so now she has the op more options, I think, now to still have that connection to home, you know, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of students, a lot of individuals, young and old, you know, that want to continue their education, live off the reservation, but they're trying to find that connection to come back home. You exactly. know, and now that with the pandemic, you know, that's kind of probably one of the positive aspects that it's brought was that connectivity with people, but far beyond than just face to face. Yeah. I agree. I, I fully agree. And I think one of the things to think about when we look at the future is that Danette College is just not about degrees. It's mm -hmm. also about access to our knowledge. So let's say a student is in, uh, you know, Pick a town, let's say Miami, Florida, uh, in high school, and they are not surrounded by people that speak Navajo, but they should have an ac access to that language. So, you know, one of the things we're looking at is to say, how do we then create a truly online language system where they could punch in their census number, if you will, and they could get free uh, uh, language lessons right there from wherever they live? Looking at things beyond just a degree, I think it's really important. Because if we just focus on the degree, we leave out an awful lot of people. You know, one of the, the data points that I keep looking at that I think is really important about the Navajo Nation and also about building a stronger Navajo Nation is within the reservation, we have about 29,000 people. They don't have to be, you know, Navajo, but 29,000 people that have some college and no degree. If we could just cut that in half, if we could just cut that in a quarter so that they could earn their degree or go back to college, they would raise their salaries. They would raise what they generate for their family. That would have a profound impact on the Navajo economic uh, situation. And I think those are the kinds of things we look at. We don't have to change big pictures. We can take one student at a time, you know, one person at a time and change their life, which then, because we live in our communities, begins to change the community, which then begins to change the Navajo Nation. All right. And when we talk about campus health and wellness, how are we going to be able to convey that to people that are going to school virtually? I think a couple things that we, we look at is one, we have to de, you know, stigmatize this idea of uh, mental health and having, you know, a, a sound uh, spiritual foundation. I think one of the things that we look at is that we kind of focus, like you said, it's only if you're in the proximity of the people that are around you. But how do you deal with people you don't see? I think that's what we've really looked at this past, you know, two years with the pandemic is that we have to look beyond that. So we can provide opportunities online. We can provide opportunities to provide services to students who may be further away. But the other part of that, too, is that if you take the example of social media, but then you take it to a, a smaller group setting, you could actually have groups where they could get together and share their experiences, begin to provide that opportunity of support. So it's not just about being, you know, you're shaking hands with somebody, 
but it also could be that you're zooming together and you're providing an opportunity to bring people together to share their experiences to share their their uh, lessons learned as we move forward so though though we think about this sometimes in a really big aspect of you know it's about doctors and not enough counselors and not sometimes it's just about making connections and i think that goes back to our foundation of care which means we really have to go beyond just the literal interpretation but think about this more about a responsibility and accountability to each other and not allow technology to be you know the the wall in between us but actually let it be the avenue that we are able then to meet you know these challenges and is that where we bring in the holistic integration aspect of the strategic themes? Yeah, I think the thing that we have to look at, and when we talk about holistic integration, a big part of that is to say, how do we remain true to the founding of our college? This college was founded on very, you know, unique uh, principles, you know, the Navajo philosophy, and it's infused. But we have to remain true to that because now we're becoming much more of a modern society. But if we lose that foundation, then we might as well close our doors because without our Dinesh philosophy, without our integration of being able to say, you know, this Navajo um, uh, approach helps us in agriculture, helps us in economics, helps us in, you know, whatever, teaching and education, without that foundation of integrating Navajo throughout everything, not just our curriculum, but also in the way we do business and student affairs, without that, we might as well be just another college living in a city. So that holistic integration is important because it puts us back to our roots. It makes sure that we are meeting the needs of all the students, but we're need, we're need, we're meeting those needs through their, you know, their culture and their history and their language. And then the culture environment here on Dinah College campuses, um, not just this campus, but all the um, the other eight campuses, because I know we got two new microsites that just went up in Newcomb and in Anneth, you know, which I think were really sorely needed, especially in those really rural areas, you know, and there's still a lot more areas that I think we we can still make an impact, you know, in, in such areas like that. But how does our, how does, how does that reflect our mission and our relationship to one another? Yeah, I think one of the things, and I always remember when I first applied for this job and I was going around to the different community events where I had questions um, asked of me by the community, by students, I had a couple questions asked of me by students. How can you make them be nicer to us? And that has stuck with me. And that's not talking about, you know, faculty. That's about be, treating people with respect. That's about when someone comes in to say, I have a question, not saying, you know, go to the back of the line, you know, and shouting and barking orders. It's about being open and welcoming. Those types of things make a difference. You know, when you walk into a room, do you feel welcome? When you walk into a campus, do you feel like it's there for you? You know, the whole idea of a tribal college was that this college was built for the Navajo people. Do they feel like it's still theirs? It's not just because the college is a tribal college, but also how are you treated? How are, you know, how are you treated when you walk into an office? How are you treated when you walk onto a campus? Does it look welcoming? That's what we're talking about when we talk about the environment and the culture. And that is that people treat each other with respect. I think one of the hardest things that I see day in and day out is that we talk about we have this foundation rooted in Navajo culture, but sometimes we don't practice it. And we sit and we gossip and we talk about people and we talk behind their back and we don't treat people with respect. What we have to do is begin to communicate with integrity that if something like that happens, we need to say, you know, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to you. And if people started doing that, this would change the culture of this college overnight. But too often we like to listen to the bad stuff. We like to listen to things. And I think that's what we mean by changing the culture and environment, that we truly become student-centered, not staff-centered, that we truly become, you know, an institution that is trying to address the needs of the students as they see it, not the needs of the students as we see it as administration and staff.
And understanding that um, our college, although is probably primarily Navajo students, but we also have non-Navajo students here that come to this campus as well. Have you heard any of their input or any of their feedback on how they have been feeling here on this campus? I know one of the challenges, you know, we have is students living in the dorm, right? Mm -hmm. right? And then we have holidays and where do they go? And yet, you know, we're supposed to be a, a, a college that's rooted in, you know, we take care of people, we take care of our, our neighbors and all that. And then when, you know, Christmas comes, we say, get out, you know, so we've heard things like that. So we have to look back at ourselves. We have to hold that mirror up to ourselves and see what are we really, what do we really believe in? And so this is a process where we hope to hear more from students, all students. You know, I do hear stu uh, students who are, are non-Navajo speakers who then feel like they're made fun of or they're, they're shunned if they're in a classroom and they say something, they're laughed at. That's what we, we mean by the culture, changing that culture so that people are curious, people are taking chances, people feel safe. A safe environment is not just physical safety, but it's also emotional safety, educational safety, spiritual safety. All of those contribute to the environment. And speaking of our environment, how are we taking care of our facilities? I know we've seen many improvements here on the Diné College campus sites, as well as um, the other sites, um, Winter Rock sites. You know, I've seen some improvements there. You know, the Tuba City sites, you know, definitely is getting up and going, especially with the nursing program that they have, you know, right at their front door. And now with the new home and the Aneth, you know, places, uh, what else do you see in the works? Well, I think, you know, one of the things we have to look at when we begin to think about facilities and new facilities is it has to be driven by the programs. So part of this process of strategic design is listening to people, developing what our new ideas will be, and then making sure that our facilities match our curriculum. And so that's something that we're looking at. We have a big emphasis right now in the STEM areas. You know, at, at Shiprock, we're in the process of building a math and science center. We're gonna build a science wing here at um, the Say Lee campus. And in Tuba City, we were looking at trying to possibly build a lab there to help you know address the medical uh, 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 program that we have there. So looking at it like that. But the other thing is looking at other ways to grow. So one of the things that's really new when we talk about the Navajo Nation economy is, you know, again, I talked earlier about we used to be a cold economy. That's now changed. We used to be an agriculture economy. That changed. So what is our new economy? It's going to be built on a lot of different things. It won't just be a singular um, item. But one of that one of those things that I think is really important is the idea of a, a, a an emerging economy. And that's what we're kind of focused on right now. And that is this technology transfer. We're the first tribal college to, to have any patents. We have three patents um, from, from our, our Dr. Olex, as I call him. And it's really exciting what they're doing. And he is in the process of doing more. But one of the things that we're looking at is we need to create alternative revenue streams to help meet this needs. Because we can't always rely on the federal government to pay for things. We can't always rely on the Navajo Nation. We have to find ways to create the funding to build these programs, to build the facilities. And some of that is looking at new markets. So we're in the process of getting our charter renewed, which will allow us then to create holding companies or LLCs. And along those lines, you know, we're looking at building a Navajo wool mill that would then take what is a traditional um, part of our life and our culture, but then take it into a modern realm, which will help our producers of sheep and wool, but also would help create a new market. So looking at things like that. So what does that mean in terms of facilities? It means tomorrow's facilities may not just be a simple classroom. They have to meet whatever needs we have. And so right now, some of the things we're looking at is building a center for economic development, um, a tr technology transfer center. We are looking at trying to build a um, at the Tuba City campus a student affairs center that would help bring in a library, a cafeteria, student affairs. You know, we're looking at building an administration uh, center for our Shiprock campus. So we're looking at these things as well as renovating. You know, right now, you know, we are working to try to get the Danette College 
um, Act reauthorize. Within that act, there is $7.5 million that would help with O&M. Previously, we had $2 million a year. We never received a penny from the federal government for O&M, even though it's in our Enabling Act, the, at that time, the Navajo Community College Act. We feel that if you look at from the time that act was enacted till now, and we haven't been funded, we've lost out on over $100 million. Just imagine what $100 million would have done to improve the facilities we have right now. Well, we can't wait, so we're focused on trying to get that act passed to be able to upgrade what we do have. But then we're also looking at trying to create these new programs, but having the facilities to match them. So we had an initiative when I came on board of about $40 million capital campaign. We've already hit that. We've already um, received or in the process of receiving $40 million to improve what we have, to build some new buildings. Now we need to go further. So we're in the process of developing the next phase, phase two of our capital campaign. Probably we're looking at a possibly $50 million there, and that's going to be a new activity center uh, that would also house a new cafeteria here at the Saley campus, new dorms here, um, an athletic field so people could have something to do outside. These are all things that, you know, we have in, in place. And what, what, what I tell people is that, you know, when you say that, a lot of people think, oh, geez, that's never going to happen. But then I think, well, five years ago when I said we're going to have $40 million raised in four years, well, I said at that time, six years, we got it done in four years, it never was going to happen. So we're going to make it happen and we're going to make this college. It already is the best tribal college in the country, but we're going to go after the reputation of other colleges soon too. Very good. Now I'm going to ask you a personal question as a student here, and I'm partial to this question because I work here in the media department in our college. And I noticed with your new uh, team of social media specialists that you have, as well as the marketing communication and the radio, are we looking into, or can we look into possibly getting a film and journalism school here at Denet College? I have been in contact and I have been in discussions with um, friends of mine. My, uh, my first career was in journalism and photojournalism. I was the editor of the Navajo Times today when it was a daily newspaper. I worked at uh, newspapers, you know, in the past. I've been a freelance uh, journalist that worked for the New York Times and the different places. I would love to create a journalism program. We have a, a donor who is interested in film uh, that we've talked to in the past. So it is something that we are exploring. I think one of the things that we have to look at when we create programs is one, is there is there an interest, right? Do we have enough people? At what point and at what number of uh, students do you break even? At what point do you actually make a profit, if you will? How do you sustain that program? You know, in terms of, you know, you need new equipment, new equipment comes up all the time. So things like that. So it is something that we are exploring. We did look at creating a pathways uh, to begin with, with ASU. Um, the, the school kind of backed off. I'd like to create a, a uh, college newspaper to kind of start with, but make it online, not something else. You know, try to use new technology to, to look forward, creating things like that. So I am very interested in that. So the answer to your question is I really hope so, <laughs> um, but I can't promise it at this point, but I would love to be able to do that going forward. Awesome. And one last thing. When you said the nation's college is in your hands, who were you talking to? Everybody. The Navajo people. Um, because we as the administration are here as kind of just taking care of the college, helping it move forward, growing, take, you know, our caretakers in a way. We have a larger role sometimes, but the new ideas come from students. You know, as we go forward, it comes from community members, comes from what the economy is. And so I think when I say the nation's college is in your hands, it means this is the nation's college. It's for the Navajo people and what the Navajo people want. Maybe not specifically saying, I want this and I want that. And then you can't do everything for everybody. But when you have a process, and it goes back to your question about process important. If you have a process that looks at here are what we you know, see the needs of the Navajo Nation. Here is our expertise of faculty. Here are the facilities we have. We can do this. 
when we start looking at it from that perspective, that is helpful. The other thing that I think is really important, that one of the things that we are really looking at is there are literally hundreds, if not more, of Navajo faculty that are working at institutions all across this country. And so we tell them, you know, come back to the nation's college, give back to your college. And so we're trying to find a way to also provide that expertise and knowledge that is out there to come back here. And maybe it's not full time, but to have visiting professors coming in from all over you know, the country and the world, if you will, I think that is also indicative of the idea of this is the nation's college and it's in their hands. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here that I always ask all my interviewees. Mostly students have been coming in to interview, but you're here and I'm going to ask you this question. Who inspires you? I... I think if you would have said inspired me instead of inspires, mm -hmm. I would have said my mom and dad. They're the ones that gave me the foundation of, uh, of not being afraid, of standing up for what you believe, speaking out, and helping others. So that's where you know that comes from. I think today, who inspires me? I'll be honest. You know, the last two years uh, are the students at the Net College what they have done in terms of um, not giving up on their goals and their dreams in the middle of a pandemic is beyond courageous. The stories that have been shared with me by students is something that, you know, I'll never forget, you know, what they had to deal with. So right now it's the students that inspire me. And in addition to that, you then start looking at the faculty the faculty come in and they're helping and they're going through the same things. They have families. They've had people that have passed in their families and they're coming back. And then you just go down the line. Facilities, they've been here every single day during this pandemic. They didn't work from home. Security, they couldn't work from home. They had to be here on patrol face to face before we had any, you know, um, vaccine or anything. And they came to work every single day. You know, that's where I find my inspiration. I just look out the window and see any of our employees or students walking on campus, and that's inspiration for me. Most excellent. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for sticking with us and making the strategic design not actually a plan, but a process. You know, like you said, I think that's something that a lot of community members and students have felt left out of. You know, as Dr. Garrity had mentioned, it's something that you mentioned as well is something that was usually a meeting that was held on the sixth floor. But, you know, you know, you've done good and made well on that promise of bringing the sixth floor down and to everybody, you know, so yeah, on that part. And yeah, I'm I like look at it a little differently. I don't think the sixth floor has come down. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has come up to the sixth floor. I think that the idea uh, uh, because otherwise it makes it look like, you know, we're on the top and we're g g going down. That's not the idea that I think. I think the voices have risen to the sixth floor and we're in the process of listening. Excellent. I really like that you rephrased that. Because <laughs> like I said, you know, it's a process, you know, not only for the, the faculty and everyone here, but it's also a process for us community members and students as well to try to understand where exactly we fit in and then I guess it's kind of like a surprise and a shock that we actually have a way in now, a, a seat at the table, a voice to be heard, you know. So that is really good. And I think we're on the right track. And for me as a student, you know, and a young person, you know, having the Navajo Foundation teachings and philosophy as a background to stand on. And for me, I think about how are we traveling into the fifth world? You know, because Navajos, you know, it, it fifth or sixth world, you know, everyone has their own different definitions of which world we're in, you know, and both are right, you know. But to me, you know, the way I look at the college and the way you had just mentioned how we're going to use, how we have to use technology as not something to hold us back, but something to help us get to where we're getting to. And when you go back to the stories of how Navajos travel from the fourth world to the fifth world, we travel on a rainbow. You know, and to me, when I thought when I when you had mentioned how we're going to bring technology more and be 
and use that a little bit more in our journeys to our economic succession, you know, I think about how we're going to use that technology to travel from this world to the next, you know, because the technology does possess, you know, rainbows, you know, so that's just what came to mind when you had said that. And I really do appreciate you coming into our studio here and giving us some, you know, giving us some clarifications, especially on the themes, because some times, you know, you don't really get the gist of the meaning of certain things when it's in such a public town hall meeting. But, you know, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come out and see us. And that was Dr. Monty Russell, president of Diné College, giving us a summary about the strategic design process. And you've got Stephanie here on 92.1 FM, Diné College's Warrior Radio on KXWR.